and you hear DI, that means disproportionately impacted. Um, that is referring to um, the term that is in, in Spanish, comunidades afectadas de manera desproporcionada, meaning a community that has more than its share of impacts, which is the statutory term that we're all here to discuss. So um, Diego won't necessarily have to interpret the, the full um, acronym each time. We are just going to use that acronym in both English and Spanish. And those of you who are speaking in English should please feel free to use it. Um, so with that conversation about language justice out of the way, um, Let's turn it over now. Um, Ian said he had to step away for a moment. So maybe Renee, if you are comfortable and, and available, would you mind giving us a land acknowledgement to launch the meeting? Okay, I'm guessing Renee is not at her computer either. So I will go ahead and- Sorry, I'm on another call right now. Okay, um, thanks Renee. Hopefully you're able to join us more fully in a moment. So I will just go ahead and um, acknowledge that as we welcome everyone to this meeting, we are in Colorado, which includes the lands of the Ute, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Diné, Lakota, Apache, Obloan nations and many other tribes, and that the sovereign tribal governments of the Ute Mountain Ute and Southern Ute Indian tribes still reside within this state. These tribes are the original stewards of our natural areas, and we want to take a moment to honor and respect those original stewards of the environment and our relationship in their relationship with the land. Um, and that's, I think, particularly important for this task force um, and in considering the definitions of thinking about our relationship with those tribal governments. We've, of course, had kind of some initial conversations with each tribal government about um, where they would like to fit within the definition of disproportionately impacted communities. So that's an important reminder of the context for our work today. Um, so with that, I'd like to call everyone's attention to the agenda. So you can access the agenda in the shared drive, um, which um, you all should have access to. And I will provide a link here momentarily after I put a link to the agenda here in the chat. Um, so we have a lot of things to talk about today. Just to start off with, I do wanna do a quick um, review of the task force members who are on the call. Um, we're fortunate to have some folks kind of beyond our normal subcommittee members. So, um, I'm just going to quickly name them off um, so folks who are members of the public know who the task force members are rather than calling on each person individually. But we have with us Doug Dean, Gary Arnold, Michael Sapp, Tyson Johnston, Ian Tafoya, who is the chair of the subcommittee, Dominique Gomez, Rene Chacon, Robin Willey. Are there any task force members who are on the call with us today who I did not just name? All right, I don't see any others. And um, I will also just note that at times, Doug may call on his colleague, Kelly Crandall, to speak up on behalf of the Public Utility Commission as well. Um, so with that, I wanna next kind of just recap what happened during our previous meeting. Um, we had really two primary presentations. One was on housing cost burden data. There's a link in the agenda um, to the workbook that Margaret Horton put together. You can access that here. It's a little bit of a long hyperlink, but that's hopefully a helpful context for which census block groups meet the definition of housing cost burden. After reviewing the data and discussing it, the task force was generally leaning towards keeping that component in the definition. So that is something we'll continue discussing today. The other thing I wanna make sure that everyone um, has access to that we won't be reviewing further today is the discussion on the reliability of, of Census Bureau data. Rani Kumar is going to touch a little more on a, a related topic, but I want we won't go into the in-depth analysis of the write-up that Tova Saltzinger, our intern, provided at the last meeting, but did want to make sure everyone knew where to access that in case they weren't at the meeting or wanted an opportunity just to read through it one more time. Um, with that, Ian, is there anything you want to add that I, I left out in, in that recap of the past meeting? I will take that as a no. And then finally to, to 
cap us off, I will go ahead and share a link to the subcommittee's Google Drive um, so that you can access all the files through the subcommittee at the link I just provided. Um, so now that we've finished our discussion of the agenda, let's go ahead and dive into our first discussion topic. Um, we're actually already a little behind schedule. I should have allocated um, more time for that, um, which is something that came up at the last task force meeting. So just for those of you who, who weren't there or maybe need a refresher about what we talked about at the last full task force meeting in August, um, at that August 25th meeting, the task force discussed whether disproportionately impacted is really the best term to define communities that experience environmental justice concerns. Um, a lot of task force members did express that the term disproportionately impacted is a form of deficit framing um, because it does define communities by their deficiencies rather than their strengths. So, you know, if we think a lot about um, some of the conversations that actually Dr. Dickinson introduced with some of her public comments to this task force, I see she's with us today um, at one of the, the earliest meetings of this subcommittee back in maybe February or so, um, you know, there's a real risk that by defining environmental justice communities, we could sort of have 20th or 21st century redlining, right? We might inadvertently discourage investments. We might sort of make it sound or appear like a community is, is bad or dirty or, or just not a good place in some way, right? And so that terminology we use does matter. And so it, it's also a little bit confusing sometimes, I think, for folks to wrap their minds around what does disproportionately impacted mean, since the definition does include um, both literal metrics of what of, of disproportionate impacts, the, the cumulative impacts prong of the definition really gets at that. Um, but it also includes other components that are, are purely demographic, right? And we know that there are often links between certain demographic groups and, and areas more prone to those cumulative impacts. Um, but we wanna make sure that um, we, uh, you know, choose a term that makes sense. Um, Obviously, other state agencies and the federal government use different terms like overburdened or disadvantaged communities. Um, those, of course, share the same challenge with deficit framing. Um, and then last but not least, you know, the term disproportionately impacted is, is not plain language, right? It, it's sort of a, a complex subject. I, I'm not sure I'd ever seen the word disproportionately written out before I saw it in this definition. And it is a term that... Um, you know, it is, is in the dictionary, but not in, in common um, use. So there may be ways to choose a, a different term that is more accessible. Um, and just, you know, selfishly as the, the folks who try to practice language justice on our team, we would love to have a term that's a little easier to translate into Spanish. Um, of course, as we discussed at the beginning of this meeting, disproportionately impacted community in Spanish is comunidad afectada en manera desproporcionada, which is quite a few more syllables than English. So with that um, framing, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ian to see if he has anything he wants to add, and then I'd love to open it up to discussion to task force members to see if you all have ideas on alternative terms that we should be using instead of disproportionately impacted. Oh, thanks, Joel. Thanks for doing the land acknowledgement. Thanks for taking over. I had a run for a second, but I'm back. And um, I don't really have anything else to add. I think that's a pretty good summary of like where we're at um, collectively. I do have one that was submitted to me um, just as a conversation starter. I have, maybe we want to start with like, what does positive framing look like? Or but I, one that I had heard uh, was environmental justice priority community. That one was suggested to me by students. Um, but I, I'm really interested in hearing the overall dialogue between individuals, but it is pretty clear to me um, that not only the tribes tell us that, I think the rural communities just reflecting back to our time in Grand Junction, that I think it behooves us to try to make moves here um, and not just choose something from 1990s. Thanks, Ian. We have one idea on the table then, and I'm glad you got that feedback um, of, of an option of environmental justice priority community. Other ideas from task force members or 
um, thoughts on, on that potential of using the term environmental justice priority community? Equity justice and something that strays from a deficit paradigm constantly. That's why even in nonprofit spaces, especially a lot of equity and resources end up being treated as a form of charity instead of equity. So being able to recognize that these are only disproportionately impacted communities because they're not seen in an equitable way. Thanks Renee and yeah, absolutely. We wanna think about um, avoiding that deficit framing paradigm. So was your suggestion an equity priority community? Yes. Thanks. All right, we have two options then, equity priority community, environmental justice priority community, thoughts on those options? Yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, um, I just think we need to be careful here because uh, I mean, in Senate Bill 21-272, the legislative language that we're required to follow is disproportionately impacted communities. And so I, I don't know how much time we wanna spend on this when we have um, all, all the other work to do it doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, it, I guess it doesn't matter what we call it if we're straying from the statutory definition. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, and we don't want to spend the whole meeting on this for sure. We have just kind of a few minutes set aside before we get into that. But to be clear, this would be, a, as I understood the conversation in August, a recommendation to the legislature to to change the the current statutory definitions to kind of consistently use the same term, both where it appears in 21272 as well as other statutes. Uh, okay, I guess as long as we're talking about, you know, I just don't want to end up with a conflict with a statute. So if we're going to talk about changing that, that's, I guess that's fine. Thanks, Doug. Um, Tyson, go ahead. Um, you know, my initial thought is that I have no uh, immediate concerns regarding that other than uh similar but on a on an even grander scale would this have an effect on how this is handled on a federal level either um as we know there's going to be other things that are uh coming through um the the fed on the federal level that will address things like, like environmental justice, like disproportionately impacted communities. How are those gonna to tie together? Will that affect um, federal grant money, things of that nature? I, I would just like to have somebody weigh in from a legal aspect who knows about both the federal and state side and, and let us know if that's gonna have any effect before I would make any change. Thanks, Tyson. And I, I want to respond to that question without giving legal advice, but but try to provide a, a response there, um, which is just that right now we are we are purely talking semantics. We're, we're, we're setting aside a few minutes on our agenda just for that semantic rather than um, uh, substantive discussion. So the, the short answer is that the federal government uses the term disadvantaged community that of course is also a form of, of deficit framing. Um, so, but, but, the, the, but the broader answer to your question is just as right now there is no um, impact from the state having a different substantive definition um, of disproportionately impacted community than the definition of disadvantaged community used by the federal government, there would be no substantive difference um, to, to changing the term used by the state, of course, to be eligible for federal funding, depending on the, the nuances of the federal funding program, you, an area would need to meet the federal definition, right, that the federal government uses its, its federal definition for all of its federal purposes. The state uses our, our state definition for all of our state purposes, and, and that doesn't change regardless of what term is actually used to refer to the area. So, um, as a quick reminder, in, in Colorado and Viroscreen, we do have a, a map showing the areas that meet that federal definition of disadvantaged community um, Im embedded as what we call the Justice 40 layer in the tool. So we try to make sure folks are at least able to use our state tools to identify areas that meet the federal definition, but this kind of terminology discussion doesn't have an impact on the substantive application. So does that answer your question?
Yeah, I, I, I think that answers it pretty much. I don't see other hands up. So we now have two options on the table as alternatives. We have environmental justice priority community suggested by Ian and equity priority committee suggested by Renee. Um, Renee, go ahead. If that's the case for other um, bills and other rulemakings in the past to focus again, honestly, to second Ian's then for environmental justice, especially if we're going to talk about definitions and DIC. Thanks, Renee. So I hear you kind of um, honing in on, on Ian's idea of environmental justice priority community. Do other folks have thoughts? Is it still really long? <laughs> like for the translation, you know, I mean, I do want to acknowledge that as well. Comunidad de Justicia Ambiental. I'm trying to, like, even longer than that. For real, that's true. And that's just in Spanish. Like, really, you know, as we're seeking longer, more expensive language justice, it's not just even how it impacts Spanish. Do you have an alternative you might want to suggest, Ian, or, or anyone else? That's why I wasn't sure if equity can be in that space too, because then it can also start including why even language barriers. We're having to translate a lot this a lot of this into Spanish, and it's not layman's terms. It's being really mindful and conscientious of our communities and sensitivities there. Um, so Renee, are you kind of going back to priority equity community or equity priority community as a suggestion to, to shorten it? Potentially, yeah, those are the only two I can think of, honestly, that can be able to address this because we're, again, trying to still move from a deficit mindset, but be inclusive in a way with these forms of sensitivity too from community. So I would like to hear what other task force members, especially grassroots members, think of it. Dominique, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and call on you next. Yeah, just one thought. I wonder if there's some sort of um, investment priority communities or, I mean, I, I do like the framing of environmental justice because that does narrow in on what we're talking about. But I also think what we want to prioritize these communities for is investments. Um, that might not be the only thing, but that's at least a lot of the framing that would um, align with our thinking, at least for my agency. So I'm wondering if there's something around investment priorities. Um, Ian, go ahead. I actually just decided to Google what equity prayer community was and then translate it. But when I did that, it came up with the Bay Area already using this for a very similar type of definition. And I dropped the link. Uh, it was seeking to replace the use of underserved communities or historically underserved communities. Thanks, Ian. That's a great idea to see what other places are already doing. And, and Ronnie, why don't you go, go ahead? Yeah, just wanted to drop a similar link that has a list of all the definitions currently used across the US. So just for brainstorming ideas, if people wanted to peruse that. Thanks, Ronnie. Yeah, and that that's a great idea that that's the same list that's in our agenda, right? Yes, exactly. Great. Um, okay, so so we have some I Sounds like some additional support for equity priority communities from Ian, given the use of it in other jurisdictions. Um, Dominique brought up investment priority communities. Um, I, I don't want us to spend the whole meeting on this. We, we allocated um, up until 3.30. So since we're getting to the end of that, any task force members want to make a strong pitch for, for one of those options or the other. Um, and then 
Similarly, what do you all think about trying to take a quick straw poll among the options today versus presenting them for a straw poll of all of the task force members of the meeting in October? Switching back to equity provisions or equity priorities for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can just pick, I think we just add those top two for straw polling along with DI community at the next meeting. That, that gives us three options to discuss. That, that works for me as well. Okay, thanks everyone. So it sounds like we have kind of a um, preliminary consensus around equity priority community, but we'll bring all three of those options being equity priority community, investment priority community, and environmental justice priority community to the full task force for a quick decision in the, the October meeting. Um, and please put on your thinking caps between now and then. Um, you know, it's it's an important discussion to have. Um, names have power and, and wording matters. Um, and we don't wanna to spend too long on it at the October meeting because there's obviously a lot of substantive um, things to discuss too. So thank you all for the brainstorming there and um, uh, hopefully we reach a good solution and I'm glad we are kind of applying you know all those discussions about assets framing here. So um, moving on to the next point on the agenda, I will now turn it back to Ronnie who just um, helpfully shared that link. Ronnie has developed a presentation um, on a really two topics that, that came up in the last meeting where, where task force members had questions. One is about sort of questions of 2020 census data reliability and why despite the conversations at the last task force meeting, we ultimately do not believe that those reliability issues weren't changing the percentage of people of color in the current definition. Um, and then the second um, aspect of Ronnie's presentation will be on using enviro screen thresholds to um, identify areas with cumulative impacts. And I just want to remind all the task force members that you can access um, both user instructions and an um, mapping application that Ronnie created, um, which are linked in the agenda for this meeting that is in the calendar invite. So with that, I will turn it over to Ronnie. And Ronnie, I know you've been around for a couple of these meetings now, but not all the task force members have met you yet. So if you don't mind giving a brief introduction of who you are and what you do with our team, that would be great. Yeah, hi everybody, good afternoon. My name is Rani Kumar and I am the EJ Research and GIS Analyst uh, for the Environmental Justice Program here at CDPHD. And so the bulk of my um, work will be focusing on the maintenance and update of Colorado EnviroScreen. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk slow. So I know I talk fast for interpretation. Uh, but also uh, I'm here to support with research tasks and data tasks for the, the task force and also the environmental justice advisory board. So the homework I had from the last meeting um, of this committee was to look into the, um, the suggestion of lowering or, or adjusting the threshold for people of color based on the um, concerns around the 2020 census. And then also to talk um, to provide more context for threshold setting for um, enviro screen thresholds for that uh, part of the disproportionately impacted communities definition. So I'm gonna share my screen and go through two, um, those two topics. And I'm gonna start actually with the people of color percentage threshold. So Rat, can you all see my screen now? Okay, if I'll, someone stop me if I'm, you can't, but. Um, just to start this, this is going to be um, fairly high level, but we can keep the conversation going. And ultimately, it was a, a really good question to pose of, you know, the reliability of the 2020 census. And, you know, where we ended up landing is that right now, EnviroScreen is using um, the census data, which is called the American Community Survey. Um, so ACS, American Community Survey Census Data, which is actually a five-year snapshot. Um, census data. And so we're using the 2015 to 20, 2019 data set. So we are not currently using the 2020 information. Um, and ultimately, um, because our data needs to stay locked for at least a year, um, and we launched in June 2022, we don't have um, 
current plans to update to the 2020 census data, but to, to nod to the point of what everyone was getting at with the concerns of 2020 census data, we have been in pretty in-depth discussions now with the State Demographer's Office and the US Census Bureau um, about updating to that next round and what that will look like. And there are several complexities involved in that, including, um, as people have mentioned, you know, that where do we go with the 2016 2020 data, given that there were some concerns with how the 2020 census was conducted. And ultimately, it's just very complicated. And we want to work with the data experts as we move through that. And so just the, the needing to take time to really figure out how to how to do that, um, and doing that with our data set. And along with that, the update of the Census Bureau um, geographies is a whole other planned um, update for Enviro screen because right now we're tied to the 2010 census geography and with the 2020 census data there was an entire update so long story of all of this or long story short of all of this is that it's just a very complicated process and we are talking to the data experts on where to go with that so with that um, it is important to just say that um, the sort of lowering of the threshold at, at a at a five five percent across the state just doesn't make sense statistically given the, the census data that we work with. And there's a lot more nuance to it. Um, but to also say that we hear the concerns about the 2020 census data and we're, we're working on that. Uh, so one thing that I would put out that we can talk again in more detail is that, um, you know, a lot of states or other places that use these environmental justice thresholds uh, use per percentile thresholds versus just the percent um, which we currently use 40% for all of our demographic indicators, but rather than, you know, saying 40% people of color, 40% low income, 40% housing cost burden, there is the option to talk more um, sort of of the ranking and percentile comparison. And I'll get more into percentiles in the next part of the presentation, but if you have more questions about why we are not um, advising to change that, at least change the threshold based on our data plans right now, um, I really, yeah, want to get into the questions, but that's our official finding for, for looking at that threshold change. And then getting into the, the cumulative enviro screen, um, the cumulative like score when we're thinking about environmental burdens, I just wanted to re-post the definition, which I know obviously you are very familiar with, but it's helpful for me to contextualize where this conversation is going. So I was just talking about that first prong indicator uh, with the 40% demographic threshold, which is displayed here on the right at the block group level. And then EnviroScreen is really addressing this third prong here of cumulative environmental burden uh, and socioeconomic, um, socioeconomic stressors. So combining those two things to say where, where environmental and socioeconomic burden is stacking up for communities across Colorado. So I, there's the same slide here in Spanish, so I'll pause. Um, to let people maybe take a look at some of the language on that. But going more into depth on this concept of percentiles, which we can go back to if we want for the, the other thresholds. But as a, as a refresher, um, so it's related to the statistics, but what we see in, uh, in viral screen is that we're using percentile rankings. And that means what we're doing is we are comparing one score um, to the rest of the group score. So this is allowing us to rank. We have it uh, sort of on a spectrum from least to most burdened. And when I, when I think about percentiles, um, I think the easiest example is when you're thinking about test scores. So if you have students, you know, in a, a range of students, they might all get different grades. But if you ranked the class, you're going to have somebody who is, you know, the, the top percent and then some people who are falling in the lower percent. And so with EnviroScreen, that's the same thing that's happening. We're having the people that had the, the least high scores all the way to the most high scores. And we can talk about that in terms of percentiles. So a common um, percentile that is used for environmental justice concepts is this 80th percentile. And what that actually is talking about is the highest 20% of scores. So if you look at this um, distribution, and this is the actual distribution of block groups in Colorado, you're seeing the highest 20% of scores over here on the most burdened side. So if you were to say the 95th percentile, you're looking at the highest 5% of scores. 
So with um, the decision of setting the enviro screen threshold, um, it's important to keep this concept of percentiles and sort of that ranking that happens in, in mind. And so what you're really doing when you're setting a percentile threshold is thinking about, you know, what is the highest percent of spores we're looking at across the state? So with that, what does that actually mean in practice? So this is a lot of information, but what we've done here is we've taken the possible thresholds um, that you had wanted to discuss. So we had from, um, was asked to look at the 65th to the 90th percentile. And if you think about it in this other way, you have the top 35% of spores all the way to the top 10% of spores. And we're looking at, well, what, how many block groups across Colorado are actually included in that? Of those block groups, how many meet that demographic threshold already? That DI community, 40% low income people of color housing burden. And then this is just another way of looking at what percent of all the block groups are that 40% threshold. And then in, in total, how many people are within those block groups? So as you can see, for when you have a broader percentile, when you're including more block groups, you're going to have ultimately more block groups, and you're also going to be including um, other groups besides those that meet that 40% threshold. And this is sort of getting at that cumulative burden. So we can look more specifically, but these are groups that are going to have maybe environmental exposures that are not accounted for in that 40% demographic threshold. The more um, narrow you go, so the higher percentile range you go, so like the top 10% in the 90th percentile, you're seeing more and more overlap between uh, the block groups that are the 40%, the DI community threshold, um, almost 98% of the top 10% also meet that 40% threshold. So that's a lot of numbers, but I think the main takeaway is that you have this opportunity to set these different thresholds uh, and you can see sort of what is included or not through those. Commonly, the, so the EPA EJ screen references the 80th percentile or the top 20% um, when they set their EJ indexes. And a lot of that is um, mostly down to the statistics. They wanna be focusing on the top 20% and that makes sense for them. California, California Enviro screen references the top 25%. So they're using the 75th percentile when they look at their, um, I believe they phrase it as disadvantaged communities. So again, it's really about what makes sense to this, um, to this group and looking at Colorado in particular, but that's sort of the statistical underpinning of when we talk about setting a percentile threshold. So with that, uh, you have access to this application, which what it really is just doing is it's just setting the different thresholds for Colorado and viral screen scores and allowing for you to play with that on the map to see what would happen if you set these different thresholds and how those interact with disproportionately impacted communities across the state. Uh, and I wanted to display it this way because it's pretty hard to show all of Colorado block groups in one map. So hopefully through this, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to experiment and see what that looks like for different places. So I'm gonna just pull that up right now for a, a brief um, overview and you can, uh, we can keep talking about this here or you can uh, experiment with this on your own, but how this works, you know, if you wanna search a specific place, there is a search bar there, but we have these disproportionately impacted communities uh, on those 40% demographic factors. And those are represented in the hatched yellow areas here. And you can turn these different layers on and off. So by selecting that, you turned off the yellow. And all those ranges that I talked about, the 90th all the way to the 65th percentile are available to turn on and off. So I'm just going to really quickly focus in on this 20th percentile because that's often the range people talk about for, for these thresholds. And so now the blue indicates that that's the only one that is on. So if I zoom into some place like here in Pueblo, you can see we're talking about this 80th percentile and you can see the block groups that meet both the yellow definition of disproportionately impacted community and now we're also including this block group that did not fall with that, but does meet the 80th percentile in BioScreen score. And if you want more information, you can click on the specific block group and get that data um, of what the percentile, the Enviro screen score was and where it's falling for um, the DI community. And I think I clicked on the wrong block groups. So that should be, there might be a, a threshold setting there that's wrong. Um, but you can see the, 
the different um, scores and how that is pulling. So actually, I should definitely go in and double check that if that is showing yes and it's not showing up yellow, but also maybe need to zoom in. Sorry, live demo. But that's the idea that you can go through and look at these different census block groups and see what would be excluded or, or included as you change the Enviro screen score percentile. So here, if we change it to top 15%, you can see which uh, block groups are now falling under that category. So I'm gonna stop there and we can start the discussion. And Ronnie, you did a great job with that. I actually think that specific block group you you clicked is the one where is the location of the state mental health hospital in Pueblo, where we have that um, error in the congregate group setting data that, that that we have addressed. So I think that may have been been why. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, Ronnie, thank you so much for the the great presentation and creating these tools to guide our discussion. Um, I think it's really helpful to have data and. and a tool that we can play with together to kind of visualize and have at our fingertips the ability to kind of make these decisions. So um, I think there's there's really two questions that 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 are um, teed up by the analysis that that Ronnie has provided that are relevant to the recommendations. So let's go ahead and start with um, targeting both questions for Ronnie um, and then task force member discussion around the first point. Um, and that is the sort of question of whether the um, at least the people of color indicator, but possibly other indicators as well. So or, or components of the definition is what I mean by indicator. So that the three demographic components of race, income and housing cost burden should use a percentile score rather than a raw percentage. Um, so any thoughts on that from, from task force members to start off for, or questions for Ronnie on that point? Honestly, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm concerned about what's going to translate to community, especially. So will percentile score come along or translate a little easier for them to understand what's going on or um, percentile score instead? So what California does is they actually use that language. Instead of saying percentile, they say top 10% or top 20. They actually say top, top 25%. Um, so that's how the, like, that language can be flipped so that people can understand it. And so that's why I included both the percentile and that, that highest or top percentile or percent language. Cause yeah, it's very confusing um, and should be clarified for people to understand. And so I would, if, if you do change that to the sort of underlying percentile, I would recommend that you use either highest or top to really describe what's happening. And Robin, I saw your question in the chat. You know, we we haven't sort of gone through a formal process of review or, or anything, but our I think general preference as, as your staff is that using a percentile system makes a lot more sense than using a raw number. So the raw number, um, I don't want to say it's just a um, shot in the dark. Like I'm, I'm sure the legislature had a um, sort of general sense of, of why it chose the 40% threshold that it did. But I think a percentile is sort of a lot more justifiable, right? It, you know, ultimately, I think we did sort of um, different 40% in each of the indicators, right? Housing cost burden, race, and income means a very different percentile, right? So it ultimately means we're looking at, I think, the um, 27% most impacted housing or most housing cost burdened communities, like something like 22% most um, people of color and like 18% income. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, Ronnie could fill me in, but it, it's sort of not consistent across the indicators and it's, it's an absolute metric. So 
when we're thinking about the long term, it, it makes much more sense to use a relative metric, like a percentile that will always say, what are the 20% most impacted communities in Colorado? You, you know, as most folks know, the percentage of folks who identify as people of color like in Colorado, like most states has been increasing over time. So 40% is not necessarily a particularly meaningful number 20 years from now, when that might be much more of the state than it currently is. Um, whereas using a percentile means there will always be kind of a, a focus on the areas that have the greatest percentages in, in each of those categories, right? It, it will always be the 20% most impacted, for example, rather than kind of eventually getting to a point where um, the, the number could mean all of the state or none of the state, you know, depending on, on which metric we're looking at. So does that answer your question, Robin? And Ronnie, did I characterize that accurately? It, it answers my question and I very much appreciate that additional context and understanding the recommendation. Yeah, and um, yes, Kelly to the chat. Yeah, there's sort of two conversations happening, but um, the first we're focusing on is that idea of percentiles for the demographic prong. And um, to clarify right now, um, the 40% people of color is approximately the 70, first percentile of people of color in the state of Colorado. 40% um, low income is approximately the 76th percentile of low income. So that was 71st percentile, 76th for low income, and then 75th for housing burden. So yeah, I think that it doesn't, it might make sense to look at that more in depth and see the different options. I don't know if that, we need to have a call on that today, but um, yeah, they're just different percentiles for each of those three demographic prongs happening right now as it is applied across the state of Colorado. Sorry. Maybe to pose a more direct question, um, are task force members um, open to that idea of shifting the demographic factors to percentile based metrics rather than absolute metrics. Um, and if yes, we can go ahead and prepare some maps or data that you all can look at at the October meeting to kind of make you know, decisions about where to draw the line numerically in your recommendations. But I just wanna kind of pose, pose that as a question. And if the answer is we are too far into this process to make that type of change, like that, that is totally okay. We just wanna make sure we have that discussion really as an outgrowth of the conversation that happened at the last meeting. So um, Kelly for the PC, go ahead and then Ian. Thank you very much. I, uh, could you put up the table again, please, that Ronnie had created on, I wanted to make sure if I didn't, I didn't miss something, but have you looked at the changing to a percentile for the demographic characteristics and also what the percentile is in terms of Enviro screen score um, to see higher percentile Enviro screen score as well as adjusting the percentile on the demographic indicators. So the, the table I shared is simply the Enviro screen score. Um, okay. And using, so the DIC, or sorry, the DI community that I have highlighted there is art is still using that 40 percent um, demographic so I have not taken into consideration a percentile view of the demographics in this table I just have looked you know if you look across the state separately from this table and you see how does that 40 percent POC 40 percent low income 40 percent housing burden look in a percentile range they are, tech, they are different percentiles for each of those categories because 40% of that demographic represents a different you know, percentile rank across the state. So it's confusing because we're presenting these like two topics together, um, but the separate, the, just to keep in mind the prong, prong one, which is that demographic prong, and then EnviroScreen is addressing prong three, which is that cumulative burden prong. So that's how I would think about it. And sure. this table really is for the Enviro screen prong, and I haven't compared that to the question that you just posed. And and I um, I appreciate that. I think something that I am trying to understand for Public Utilities Commission purposes is 
where we have utilities identify disproportionately impacted communities. We may have currently utilities with large portions of their service area falling under the demographic definitions related to census blocks. And so to me, I wonder if that understanding moving to a percentile on those demographic features and also seeing where that aligns with uh, the cumulative impacts and the EnviroScreen score and the higher percentages of that, I kind of wonder if that might be a useful um, thing to see in order to understand how to think about the legislative definition and, and how agencies should approach that. Because I do wonder in a rulemaking context how we would how we would choose a percentile on EnviroScreen that applies in a particular kind of case. But um, so yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Kelly. And that, that is sort of the question I was posing, right? Is is do you want us as staff to work on that prior to the next meeting? Um, you know, sort of our, our assignment from the last meeting was um, look at different percent raw percentages of people of color and we sort of explained why we took a little different path on that to kind of instead recommend maybe considering percentiles since changing the raw percentages of people of color wouldn't actually address the issue with, with the census data accuracy given the data set we're relying on for now so um, assuming task force members want to explore this percentile idea, we can definitely get those data tools ready for you to look at at the October meeting. So Ian's hand was up, so I'll go to him first and then, then Dominique. I still feel really confused by the whole thing. That's why I put my hand down. What uh, could we do uh, to help you I'm, feel I'm less confused too? Thank you. C could you, either of you, kind of specify what, what's confusing or what would help kind of um, demystify the, the question a little bit? I guess I'll start. I, I think if you, if you could, could prepare something so that I could look at, um, I think that might help. Um, and then the in full transparency, I was traveling back from a meeting to my office. So Ronnie, I kind of missed half of your, your presentation. So my apologies and certainly appreciate the work. But when I jumped on, it was just a little confusing. I just seemed to see something. I think that'll help inform and, and I think could help take me from not being so confused. Yeah, I think um, I agree with all the statements and percentiles and percentages are very confusing. And so I will just add that the current way, the first prong, that demographic prong is talking about things is, you know, having a 40%. So say we are um, in a community and if 40% of that community uh, is people of color or 40% is low income or 40% is housing burdened, that's the, the DI. But a, potentially what we're suggesting a better metric is instead of saying areas that meet sort of that, you know, oh, almost half of people meet that, um, is to talk, instead of talk about areas that have the top scores. So you're not relying on the 40%, but instead you're saying where in Colorado are areas that have um, high scores or high percentages of people of color, low income or housing burdened. And let's not um, set that 40%, but instead let's compare across the state and say, where are the, where are the top scores of that happening? So that's what a percentile definition would do. It would flip it from that 40%, which sort of just has a is a metric to use of like, oh, we're talking about 40% people of color, but instead would it flip it to say where are the top percentage areas of people of color, low income and housing burdened. So it's a relative comparison instead of a absolute comparison. And, and how does that compare to like the federal late? Uh, guidelines that we work on with our income qualified customers like is that is that kind of overlaid into this I'm just thinking about our customers who are on uh, this Excel perspective like will this impact our our income qualified customers maybe I can try to answer that Ronnie and, and just say that I think that's a bit of an um like apples to watermelon comparison, like it, it's not even like the same category of fruit, right? Because that that is ultimately 
questions about sort of individual households, right? Um, and while there are ways that we can look at kind of areas that have um, like census block groups that have higher concentrations of, of LIHEAP eligible customers, that, that's something that's in the current definition of um, disproportionately impacted community in Senate Bill 272. Um, ultimately, like that, that sort of the, the, the classic challenge we fall into of comparing populations, so groups of individuals versus like geographic areas, right? So I think, um, you know, later we're, we're going to be discussing that that menu of options, right, um, of, of what, what sort of menu of different definitions can be included and in, should be included in the definition and whether that should you know continue to include the the sort of like heap eligible sorry low income um, energy assistance program eligible um, customers and as is in, in Senate Bill two seventy two which is a great question but you know ultimately I think that it's a little bit of a different question right just because um, it, it's it's looking at sort of populations versus a geographic area um, so I, I feel like I explained that poorly because you looked more confused the more I talked to Michael but. It's okay. Is, um, yeah. I, I still have questions, but for the sake of time, uh, I'll just I'll just hold. At least I'm still a fruit, though. Um, so yeah. The question wasn't that far off base, uh, but carry on. I still have some questions, but for the sake of time, let's move on. Yeah, maybe it should be a tomato, like almost a vegetable, but but yeah, still yeah. pretty. Yeah. yeah, but you said um, yeah, um, yeah. So it, in. I think, Michael, my main takeaway from that is that additional visualization and data and things to review will be helpful for you in order to even really understand the question, which, which does does give us information about what we should be thinking about to help you all get ready for the next meeting. So That's Dominique, a good first step. Yeah. Thank so, Dominique, thank you for your patience. That was a long time before we got to you, but please go ahead. No, I, I appreciated the comments and uh, particularly the discussion of various fruits. Um, I agree it's very confusing, but I do agree with the sort of overall recommendation that I do think percentiles offer a lot of advantages. And I think as soon as we move towards just using percentiles, it will become more clear. And to Renee's point, it will be easier for us to communicate to the community because it's more about saying we want to invest in the communities that are um, the, the first priorities for these various points based on income, based on um, housing burden, et cetera. And, and I, I think that that is the, the direction I would certainly vote. Um, and I think that once we stop talking about both percentiles and percentages, it will be less confusing for everyone. Um, so definitely welcome, you know, a, a few slides or whatever would help clarify um, and make task force members feel feel comfortable. But I think for all the reasons that that Joel um, uh, shared, uh, as well as the earlier conversation, I would I would certainly vote um, in percentage of sort of or excuse me in support of a percentile um, and sort of relative approach versus an absolute percentage approach. Thank you, Dominique. Any other thoughts on this point? And if not, I think we have a good understanding of our, our homework as your staff to kind of better tee up this conversation at the um, October meeting so that there's kind of a better chance to make an informed decision, but would welcome further discussion too. No, I, I think I would just like to see, and, and you know, I don't know if this is possible, but have the ability to see both layers to see where the differences are i think that's kind of the thing that i'm again because I, I and i've said this before I, I want our work to be focused on the people who need it the most i like the idea of going with a percentile because it moves that bar to the people who need it the most but does it dilute it meaning if it's if only the top 10 percent if if the if only the top 10% are the predominantly uh, the, are predominantly people of color of, above the 40 percentile, but then we or above the 40 percent metric, but then we go to 40 40th percentile and that drags in a bunch of communities that are 
well under 40%. Now you're diluting um, the, the advantage we're trying to give the, that specific community. So I just need to understand the difference. And I guess having that on top of each other will help me understand that. Yeah, and I would just say to that, um, that is definitely possible. And right now the range is about um, the 70th percentile and above, but for those different 40% categories. So um, I think just to keep that in mind that already it's sort of looking at the top 30% and then we can explore the nuance in that. Um, so it shouldn't, it, it probably will have changes, but it's not as if um, it'll, I, I don't imagine it'll completely flip everything on its head. It's still within the sort of realm of what that 40% recommends, um, but I can make those tools to help visualize all of that better. Um, Ronnie, thank you for offering that. And we are so glad to have you on our team now and the, the capability to make those great interactive maps. So we'll definitely make sure that you all can visualize it and, and really clearly understand what would it mean to change from percent to percentile, as well as Tyson, to your point, the question of if, if a change is made to percentile, what is a reasonable percentile to choose? Um, obviously, those are two separate questions, right? But we can make sure Ronnie has developed some mapping tools for both of those. Um, so we can wrap up that discussion on that, that first category of, of what Ronnie presented to you on. Um, and then very quickly, sorry, we just had someone else join. Is, is Angelica our additional interpreter as a backup for Diego? No, okay. Um, Diego, thank you for your patience as we work to get you back up. I know this is a long um, time to go without a break interpreting. Um, so uh, I want to now turn to the other thing that Ronnie presented to you, which, which again, we now we do have, have data on. And this is a different question. So again, thinking back to the what Ronnie just presented, there, the, the definition of disproportionately impacted community in the Environmental Justice Act is a three-part definition. We've just been talking about the, the demographic components, but, but one of the components is what we often call the cumulative impacts prong. In past discussions, you all as task force members have generally expressed, yeah, thanks for calling that up for the visual, Rani. Um, so now we're gonna shift to talking about that cumulative impacts prongs, that's areas that experience cum cumulative environmental burdens, socioeconomic stressors, and a lack of public participation that contributes to persistent disparities. So we've had past conversations in which task force members have generally agreed that Colorado EnviroScreen is a good way to identify communities that meet that cumulative impacts prong, with, which is good. We, we specifically designed the tool for that purpose. So now we want to present the question to you all of whether you want to identify a specific percentile in EnviroScreen, so essentially an EnviroScreen score that is sort of the threshold or the cutoff for a disproportionately impacted community. So, the, the mapping tool, which hopefully everyone's been sort of playing with since we dropped the link in the chat earlier. Um, and I'll just drop that link in the chat again, um, as well as the instructions for how to use it. This is a tool that's really designed to help you visualize what would it mean if we choose the top 20%, so you know 80th percentile versus the top 15%, 85th percentile, et cetera, as kind of a recommended um, cutoff threshold for agencies to use in identifying areas that meet that cumulative impacts prong. So let's see if there are questions for Ronnie about that. Hopefully it's a little clearer with, with the visual data, but we can definitely clarify and then would welcome feedback from task force members if folks have um, preferences, I guess, of um, which percentile to choose. Robin, please go ahead. Hi. I um, I just want to make sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. I just want to make sure um, before we get into like what percentile that I sort of have my foundational understanding right. So I wrote down uh, four things that I think 
are sort of foundational to my understanding. So one is we're talking about using the EnviroScreen score threshold to replace like basically subsection B of the definition, not in addition, right? That That's one of my fundamental things that I, I am understanding. That that would be our recommend our recommendation to the legislature is that the statutory definition refer to EnviroScreen threshold instead of what's currently there. So um, <laughs> the answer is maybe, and it, it's up to you. So you, you could recommend replacing that cumulative impacts prong with just saying an EnviroScreen score above a certain percentile, um, or you could sort of add to that prong, recommend that the legislature add to that prong of the definition as determined by Colorado and screen. So or, it, it would really or be it could even maybe be extra statutory, which is we take the interpretation statewide that the Enviro screen score is how we determine the like identification pursuant to that section B. Yes. Right. And, okay. and that, yeah, which is I think the that that's what there has been consensus on is the past is that probably enviro screen is the right tool to use that so there's questions of does that need to be in the statute as well as like um you know what percentile if any do you want to recommend okay. but my foundational thing was that it's it's how we're going to either implement or replace or etc like the otherwise analysis under section b okay um the other the other another one is that to the extent we're talking about identifying the communities or geographic areas to recommend for a centralized equity analysis, that's not this what we're talking about, right? This is, that may be like a different threshold or grouping of such, but, but just making sure that this recommendation doesn't have anything to do with centralized equity analysis directly. Correct. Uh, you're not so okay. <laughs> past discussions have really separated those two topics out for the task force. Yep. Um, third, third is recommending a threshold. We're still leaving space for agencies to protect these communities differently in different agency actions. So we're not by recommending this threshold saying like this is a community that you know we're still leaving that space that we've talked throughout the task force about leaving, which is that like the identifying the communities that are DI communities is a separate question from how we implement the protections for them. And just making sure like that's another foundational piece, right? That I feel like I can't say enough. Um, and then last is, um, and this is sort of, a lesson learned from going through the rulemakings last year is that we have to make it clear in our recommendation that when agencies take an action, they're looking at the communities that meet the definition at the time that they're taking the action. And a community that maybe has a higher enviro screen score, let's say an agency adopts a rule in January, and then, you know, the EnviroScreen score changes for a community that August, right? Like the rule applies to the communities at the time of the January rulemaking. Like there's, that's clear. So there's rules don't change post hoc because they can't, I think, under the EPA and due process and all of those things. And so just want to think, I think we should add that to the recommendations, it, especially if we're adding potential statutory language, which is like these communities that are meet these prongs at the time of the agency action being taken to protect them or highlight them or um, engage them, right? So that's just, those were my like sort of foundational things that I just wanted to, um, you know, make sure that I, I had a, correct understanding of.
Yes, Robin, that, that's all correct. So so that, that's a long way of saying none, none of what we're asking you to look at today changes and any of those decisions that, that of course, the task force has sort of already made. Um, really, I think we're posing the question of, do you want to give a suggested baseline or default percentile for agencies to rely on, right, in their decision making? So we know from, from practice, having just done this yesterday with the Environmental Justice Advisory Board, that it's really hard to get a, a rulemaking or fundraising advisory body to kind of come in and say, like, we feel confident as experts that 80th is the right percentage to go, right? Like, so do you want to kind of give a suggested range or option or, or default baseline that, that sort of can, you know, could be written down somewhere, either in statute or just in the task force recommendations um, for what you think probably the right percentile is to kind of give a starting point or, or even like a firm, like we think this is really good, it could be either. Um, or do you think it's better for agencies to kind of try to make their own decision each time case by case? So I think um, I have Jaime still in the back of my head, right? I, I think to the extent we are talking about identifying DI communities, like uh, we have sort of come around that there needs to be one standardized definition. And so to do that, you need to have one threshold. There's no like discretion to agencies to identify different thresholds. So one threshold, but that's, that was like sort of the other piece that grows out of my space question about protecting different communities differently. And this sort of ties into what Kelly was saying, which is in any given agency action, an agency may decide to use like a different threshold to generate additional protections or like they're still looking at this universe of DI communities, but that's a floor. And like they could go beyond that or they could use different thresholds to decide how to protect different communities differently. So we're not talking about how the definition is used, which there is space for agencies to do the right thing in the context of each agency action. We're talking about identifying the DI communities in the state. And I feel like Jaime has really well advocated for the fact that like we need one one identification because um and so that would say to me that we would have one threshold in our recommendations whether it's in the statute or in the task force recommendations and that's how we implement the statute um and all others please chime in so that's my understanding of how if I may were here, but I, that's how he sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for channeling Jaime there, Robin. Tyson, please go ahead. Okay, and sorry about um, uh, some background noise, but uh, I am at the house and my kids are getting ready to go to my daughter's volleyball game. So again, I apologize for not being on camera, but um, Robin brings up a really good point uh, in that regard. And I know that we we're talking specifically about the definition of disproportionately impacted communities. But when I think of this and the use in Enviro screen and how it's used in our recommendations going forward, I, I kind of harped on this before, but Enviro screen really needs to be a screening tool. I think for the first two parts of the definition and possibly the third part of the definition, depending on where we land on um, on housing cost burden, there are defined percentages. And again, if we go to percentiles or whatever, those are defined metrics that it's really easy to say that if it falls within this defined metric, you need to take some sort of action or do something. Uh, or do additional work or include that, incorporate that into your um, notification rules and, and a lot of the stuff that's happened, uh, I guess, you know, the COGCC has gone through a lot of this. So we've experienced how you can take a, a solid number and put that into practice through the rulemakings. However, 
um, when it comes to things such as, um, you know, the part B of the definition where we're talking about historic environmental racism, things of that nature, these, these are things that are flagged, if you will, but not necessarily prevalent currently. Um, and I think we need to be careful about how we do that because really what this screening tool should say is, hey, these other things, there's already a defined percentage for the first things, but these other things are showing up here. You need to take a closer look and tell us exactly what the current status of that is. Um, and, and I know that is a long-winded way of saying that, but I almost feel like there's a dissection between those parts of the definition that are defined and the parts of the definition that are not defined necessarily. Tyson, I, I, I'm not sure I totally understand where you're going with that. So maybe I can repeat back what I, I think I heard you say, which is that you actually don't think the task force should recommend the use of Colorado EnviroScreen to, um, to identify areas that meet that cumulative impacts prong. Is, is that what you're saying? No, and, and again, and that's why, I, and I apologize, I didn't really finish my thought, I guess. Um, that's why I prefaced it with, I know we're talking about the definitions and not the implementation or usage, but, you know, by putting a threshold on the, on certain elements of EnviroScreen that may or may not be current today, you have to keep EnviroScreen as a quote unquote screening tool, not a decision tool. And that would go all the way from equity analyses to actual identification of a, I already forgot the new definition that we were talking about, but currently DI community. Um, because all of those other elements do not have current definitions, if you will, such as environmental racism, such as commu you know, communities that, um, you know, that, that were part of redlining or historic racism, not just environmental racism, but, ra but um, um, racism and suppressive practices must be looked at and make sure that their status is current. And then I go back to, I've talked about this several times before, but there are a lot of areas that are, are within redlined areas that are full of multi-million dollar condos and, you know, um, very affluent and can take care of themselves at this current point in time. What we're wanting to do is make sure we're focused on the people who cannot. Thanks, Tyson. And, and let's try to like focus the conversation just on the, the cumulative impacts prong. Let, let's not talk about the, the, the history of environmental racism prong since that's separate. So I, I appreciate you clarifying. I'm, I'm still not sure I totally understand. So I, I, I think the question, you know, well, where the task force has gone is, is saying agencies should use Colorado EnviroScreen as a tool to identify the areas that meet that, that third prong, the cumulative impacts prong of the definition. Um, the, the question we are now posing for you all is, do you want to recommend a specific threshold in Colorado EnviroScreen as the sort of default for, for what would meet that, that de definition? So are you, um, are you saying you, you one, don't support the use of Colorado EnviroScreen to identify areas that meet the cumulative impacts prong of the definition, or two, saying that you don't support using, a, a sort of suggesting a fixed percentile that should always be used in EnviroScreen for that purpose? 
I, I think it's it, it it I think the both of those kind of go hand in hand because it is a it's a screening tool. That's what it's identified as and that's what it really works as because you're looking at, especially as you get out into the rural areas and the demographics change and the size of the blocks that we're looking at changes, even if you put a percentile on that, that percentile may not reflect what's going on in that community. So uh, again, it's a screening tool. As long as we're, I say that because I can't sit there and say, I, I, I agree with um, putting a percentile on it. If people are going to view it as a decision tool, because I don't think it can be used as a decision tool. It does not, it does not work equally or equitably between rural, urban, and, and, you know, other communities and, and the arguments that would go on regarding how to weight each element would be horrendous um, to get to a point where everybody, where it was really agreed upon. So I, I would recommend that we, we can go forward and say, hey, in any instance, there is a score of above X, we recommend that you know, the governing bodies take the time to develop rules or a methodology to take a closer look at that particular community and ensure that the, you know, the appropriate tools that we're giving you are utilized. So, i.e., step one, not step only. All right, I am feeling very um, dense because I'm, I'm not sure I, I still get get it. But let, let's go to Kelly and then Ian. Um, Ian, I saw your hand popped up for a moment, and then Casey, we can always come back and I'll. I mean. I, I, I want to have kind of faces visible for the discussion, but most folks are, are camera off. So can everyone see my screen? I'm, I'm trying to track some of this in the draft recommendations document. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, maybe the visual aspect will kind of help um, bridge some of the gaps there. So um, Kelly, please, please go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I would be interested in guidance on an Enviro screen score threshold. Um, I think if we were looking at where it's kind of up to agencies themselves to assign the thresholds, um, I would, you know, I'm one of the people who would be working with decision makers in a rulemaking context and just with the commission being an economic regulator, I'm trying to figure out how it would work for us to think about setting different thresholds to use EnviroScreen to identify disproportionately impacted communities in distribution of telecommunications fund context versus an electric utility rate case versus an application from a gas utility for an efficiency program. And I, I'm not sure that that is a meaningful exercise in a, in a commission rulemaking. Um, so I would be very interested in any kind of guidance from the task force on if there is a particular threshold, even if it were kind of a minimum or a floor that the agency should consider. Um, just to kind of get that standardization guidance. So I think that's kind of going in the same direction that that Robin was raising, but I did also wanna, I think flag again from the discussion we previously had on the percentiles. I'm just interested in where data shows there's alignments between high percentile demographic indicator census block groups and high percentile cumulative impacts census block groups. Um, I, I do feel like that would be a really useful um, thing to understand better. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, that does sound really in alignment with with Robin's point earlier. Ronnie, before I call on you, Ian, your hand had gone up earlier. Did you have something you wanted to add there or a question? Take that as a no, um, Ronnie. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I hear where, where Tyson's coming from in the the context of um, wanting to make sure that 
uh, users of the tool understand, you know, the data limitations. And I think ultimately, um, I've been in sort of the environmental justice GIS world for a long time. And, you know, Colorado EnviroScreen does a very unique thing in that it's pulling, you know, with the lens from, you know, those national data sets, including EPA EJ screen, considering the, you know, Justice 40 tool, there, there is sort of a, a plethora right now. Oh, thanks, Joel. There's a plethora right now of tools out there um, mapping environmental justice and sort of the chorus you continue to hear from environmental justice advocates is the need for more granular data, uh, particularly statewide. And so that's why you see the development of things like Colorado EnviroScreen, um, Cal EnviroScreen, California EnviroScreen has been around the longest, but Washington State, um, you know, several um, count, several states in New England and, and just around the country in general, this expressed interest in state specific data. And so I think it's really important that the Tyson's point that this is quantitative data talking about qualitative things often. Um, but when you are in the role of an analyst and you're trying to communicate, um, as Kelly mentioned, to decision makers, uh, there are sort of a limited set of, of what to pull from. And Colorado and Firescreen does a really good job of pulling from these Colorado specific data sets uh, to make those informed decisions. So I just would say that uh, I hear the point of, uh, you know, making sure we have all those data caveats. But as somebody who's a data user, um, I'm actually getting a lot of questions from people around the state of what threshold would you recommend for Colorado and Viroscreen? So I think it's going to be an ongoing question. Um, so just to put that into the, the context of as uh, somebody trying to use the data that the, the threshold score or the threshold will come up repeatedly and is continuing to come up for all state agencies that I've talked to. And it's a repeated data question that we're getting. Yes, thank you for that. That that was much better uh, communicated than what I had said, and that's really what my point was: was making sure that we have we have this as a screening tool to make sure the data uh, does not um, is 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 the screening tool that helps us look into things closer and increase the validity of that data and be more refined as we make decisions around it. Thanks, Tyson. So I, I, I'm trying to get us to um, to the recommendation. So I essentially what I've done is I've added a couple sentences to to the paragraph that you all kind of reached consensus on at the last meeting, um, to reflect Tyson your point, which I think I now finally understand. Thank you, um, as as well as the point that Robin made earlier. So I, I've added those two sentences. I wonder if we could see a quick thumbs up from, from task force members um, about whether you're in agreement with those, those two um, uh, kind of concepts that we've added in here. So, so Kelly, uh, maybe, so, okay, no, no thumbs up yet. Kelly, please, please jump in. Thank you. Yeah, I think my question is on the version of Colorado EnviroScreen that's effective at the time an agency takes that in action. So, I, I think one thing we've talked about in the past, and I just want to make sure this is if this is a distinction that needs to be made, is that I think you all are going to be keeping older versions. So if there's a litigated case and you need to refer to an older version. So an example case for us could take nine months and we could have an enviro screen version that's effective at the time an entity files an application and then an enviro screen version that's effective at the time the commission makes the decision. And I guess I would, I think that we should have the flexibility to be able to use what was effective at the time they filed the case. I mean, this isn't a legal opinion, but it seems like a practical thing we'd have to, to deal with. Um, so I'm just, I'm not sure if that's a distinction to be made, but I would expect we're probably not the only agency that's, that's dealing with that. I'm not sure it's a, 
an ideal situation to set things up so that an applicant might have a case change mid course. Um, you know, when we have a decision, like a decision making process that's nine months or something like that under a 250 day statutory deadline. Because I, I don't think we can control when an application might be filed to the degree that it would be filed when there's a refresh in Viro screen. You know, a lot of those timelines are statutory. Sure, Kelly. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and obviously, many agencies have multi-stage rulemaking processes, and it would be up to the agency to um, um, decide which version, right, if, if there was an update in versions during the course of the decision making process. And I wasn't trying to suggest that it, you know, EnviroScreen 3.0 comes out the day before proceeding ends, the agency would have to automatically pivot there. So I wonder if I could sort of correct my poor choice of words. I was trying to write down Robin's idea to just um, scratch that second sentence and combine it into the first sentence, just say, that when an agency makes a decision using EnviroScreen, it should be based on a fixed single version of Colorado EnviroScreen. Does that better capture it rather than saying the version that is in place at the time the agency makes its decision? I think so. Yeah, I'll keep thinking about that as we're thinking about responsive comments, but um, that's a bit clearer to me. Thank you. Robin, that was your idea initially. Does that, does that work for you? It does. Thank you so much. I sometimes get high centered on how our rulemaking processes work, and it's important to reflect that they're different across agencies. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so let, let's take a quick show of hands again. So now just task force members, do you support adding these two sentences um, or, or thumbs? Um, um, yes or no. So yeah, go ahead and raise hands or raise your thumb if you support adding those two. See a couple of thumbs. Ian, Ian, was were you raising your hand to say yes earlier, or did you have a question? It, it was a question about the second one, but I think I'm in favor of using a fixed version. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm still not sure I'm there on like the screening tool part yet. I need to think about that more. So that's where I'm at. Got it. Thank you. Um, so a lot of thumbs, so I will go ahead and leave this in, but of course we'll need to have further discussions on, on both those points, it sounds like, but it's maybe especially the first one um, during the October meeting. So I'd welcome you to bring that there, Ian. And then um, I do want to, we're, we're a little past time on the schedule, but we, we've talked about some other important topics, kind of bring us back to this this question that we were trying to pose in this section, which is whether you all want to recommend using a specific percentile threshold as, as basically a baseline, which to, to Robin's suggestion earlier could then be potentially exceeded by agencies on a case-by-case -case basis. The alternative would be just leaving kind of the language as is and just saying agencies can determine what threshold to use each time individually on a case-by-case -case basis. So. Any further discussion on that? And if not, I will reframe that as a yes, no question for you all to do a quick um, thumbs up straw poll. Ian, go ahead. I think this is more of a question for Robin and I just wanna make sure I understand it. When you say baseline, do you mean a floor? So if they so wanted to choose to expand it, they could, but they couldn't go less, like we couldn't make fewer people. Cause my, you know, each one of these rulemakings is so hard for community to get involved and participate in. We've seen examples where commissions have chosen actions without people, enough people really present to understand it. And I guess like I would hate to see something a little rulemaking, the staff suggest they shrink it and no one's really there to advocate. Yeah, right. So I think the way I'm understanding it is that we, we as a task force are recommending that a let's say we choose the 80th, 80th percentile, right? That be used to identify which communities are disproportionately impacted. And so like across the state, right? There's no, uh, the way I understand it, again, there's no like agency discretion involved in like identifying a disproportionately impacted community. Um, 
but like in any given rulemaking or agency action, like the agency has the ability to treat different communities differently based on whether they're impacted by the agency's action at issue and or go farther than the definition, right? And so um, I, at no point am I suggesting that the word baseline or floor or, you know, whatever it is, mean that there are communities that um, wouldn't, like an agency would say, well, you're not a disproportionately impacted community because your enviro screen scores in the 78th percentile. It just may be that like, when we're looking across the communities that are in the 80th percentile, right? Agencies may say like, well, we're also gonna bring in other communities that were maybe in the 70th percentile because they are also impacted by this agency action, right? But we're not going to bring in communities, even if they're in the 90th percentile, because they're not impacted by this agency action, right? Like, it's just the one, the identification doesn't bind, isn't necessarily, like, always exactly the, how it's implemented. It's just we are identifying the communities that are disproportionately impacted or equity priority communities, whatever term we land on, um, by a percentile threshold. That's what I understand. I don't think baseline was my word, but like that's that's what I understand this, yeah, this and, language is doing. In in your example, then you're you're saying that you could remove people who had a higher score based on the discretion of these the either the staff or a small set of people, and that people would have the tool to advocate. That's what I'm asking about. No, like, is it the floor? I, no, that's I'm not saying you would remove people like you wouldn't remove the community as a disproportionately impacted community. They just aren't. I'm saying that whether a community is a disproportionately impacted community or not is not the end of the inquiry as to whether they are impacted by an agency action, right? Like agencies are directed to focus their resources on those disproportionately impacted communities that are going to be impacted by their actions. And that may involve having the agency like use empirical screen differently, potentially, than just that straight, whatever the number we recommend for identifying the community as disproportionately impacted. And so it's not that there would be a community like, let's say, I'm trying to think about how this would, right? So there's a, per, there's a, you know, a permitting action, right? And, um, you know, the, the rules or the best practices suggest that like the, the air division needs to, you know, number one, engage right, with communities that are going to be impacted, but like by the permitting action. So just because a community is disproportionately impacted based on the 80th percentile does not mean that community receives directed outreach from the air division in the context of this permit action because they're not impacted, right? So that's why I'm saying like they're not, one is not the same thing as the other. and then. In the analysis that the air division does of that permitting action, they are, again are not looking at the impact on all disproportionately impacted communities. They're looking at the impact on the communities directly impacted by that proposed permit and maybe additional communities that don't meet the 80th percentile, right? Um, but like are also impacted. And so the way the definition is applied or like the, the actions of the agency are context specific. But to Jaime's point, what is a community that is a disproportionately impacted community is set based on a specific threshold. 
that everybody uses. Like, that's just not the same thing as what does that definition mean in the context of a specific action? Does that help at all? I think I understand your example. But I also, I guess the, the second part of your example is about like choosing to bring in other people into the work. I mean, you already have that choice to do outreach to people, but the point, right, is that this ordinance or this, this effort we've been fighting for is to equitably get more for the people who need it. But wouldn't you already have the choice to en engage further as an agency with anyone else that you identified? Yes, I'm, I'm just saying that like, what, I guess my point is that we're being very specific about what the threshold that we're recommending is for. And it's for yeah, identifying and I, I, communities I, I, as disproportionately impacted, not I agree for you, directing how the, the agencies are going to conduct their actions. Mm hmm And I get I get what you're saying about like choosing of the thresholds. And I'm back to what I was asking too about like the floor, because it's like if you wanted to go to 75 and like include more people, like that's great. But if you were to backtrack it to 90, I don't that that's the part I'm understand like that I'm trying well, to get at the so let's, let's say let's say the air division. I oh I'm the air division rep, so I get to pick on the air division. So like, let's say the air division is going to propose new control measures, right? For a specific type of activity. And, and so we're, we're looking at, let's say this is a source that's sort of around the state in different um, concentrations or things like that. And so, what I'm saying is that we're looking at making sure we have to evaluate the impact of these rules on disproportionately impacted communities. That uses, let's for this hypothetical, the 80%, right? And so we're making sure we're focusing analysis on how this rule is going to impact those communities. But it's not out of bounds to say that like there might be different control measures required for some communities that are in the 90th percentile because of other criteria, like let's say the concentration of the number of sources of this particular activity, right? Let's say, and so those guys might be targeted for more stringent rules than the sources in the 80th to 90th percentile of DI communities or the sources, and we're like their division usually looks statewide, right? In the 70th to 80th percentile or that, you know, and going down the line. But I guess what I'm getting at is that there's no, this language here, this 80% baseline that we're recommending doesn't mean that all DI communities have to be treated exactly the same regardless of context in different agency actions. Maybe I can jump in to because we're, we're a little we're a little off schedule now, but that's okay. Um, you know, I, I I think we have to be really cautious about like conflating a couple things here. One of those is is the application of the definition, right? And, and we all need to keep in mind there are a lot of applications of the definition. So sometimes it is who you know it, it can be emissions reduction priorities. To Robin's point, it can be who gets enhanced outreach opportunities. It can be who is eligible for grant funding. And those will often probably mean that, that there might be reasons to prefer like wider or narrower definitions, right? So I, I don't want us to get too far down that rabbit hole of thinking about individual applications. But to Robin's point, you all have reached consensus on this idea that agencies can have flexibility to determine how to apply the definition in different rulemaking contexts based on a list of options of, of what a disproportionately impacted community can be that is on a, a menu, right? So, so that what we're talking about now, the question we're proposing is one of those menu of options is, is the cumulative impacts prong that is currently in the definition. 
agents right now, there's essentially two points of agency discretion, right? So there is one, are we going to use the cumulative impacts prong as part of the menu of options of how we are defining a disproportionately impacted community in this specific decision? And then two, what percentile would we use in Colorado and Viroscreen to identify that community, right? So there, there, there's essentially two parts there. So what, what I think what I'm trying to ask as your facilitator is that you answer that second question of if on that menu of options of, of cumulative impacts, saying that you will use Colorado and Viro screen to identify those, do you all want to suggest kind of a baseline, a floor, a default percentile score that agencies should use in their decision making, which they, they can, as to Robin's point, then potentially kind of exceed in a certain case or decide, you know, this is not a rulemaking where we want to use that part of the definition altogether. But do you want to provide basically a number on the menu that, that says default 90th percentile, 80th percentile, 70th percentile, whatever it is? Or do you want to just say what is on the menu is cumulative impacts, which you should use Colorado and Bio screen to determine, right? So the, the question is really what is on the menu, not how will agencies apply it, because you all have reached that consensus about like there needs to be variation in how the definition is applied. So does that help clarify the question or, or, or is everyone a little more confused hearing that? Joel, can you repeat it? The two, the two options again? Yeah, so so right now, what option one is is what would be these two sentences with with no track changes edits in them, right? So that is just saying rather that, that each agency should it pull the cumulative impacts option off the menu as we are going to use cumulative impacts as part of our definition of disproportionately impacted community in this proceeding there would be no default threshold, no no number that, that, that the agency has to sort of, this is our default or our baseline as, as what percentile to use in Colorado and Viroscreen, right? So that means each time an agency makes a decision, um, you know, whether it's how to allocate grant funding or it's where to prioritize emissions reductions, in each case, should the agency use that cumulative impacts prong of the definition, it would be deciding what percentile to use in Colorado and virus screen, right? Option B is you recommend either a default or a baseline slash floor of saying, if an agency is going to use the cumulative impacts prong of the definition, we think that it should always use the 90th percentile and in at least the 90th percentile in enviro screen, or if you go for a default rather than a floor in general, start at the 80th percentile as a starting point, whatever it is, but suggesting a number as the starting point for that definition. So, so d does that help? It does. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Renee, go ahead. I'm concerned not establishing a baseline on based on known science and impacts that we already have now is going to shade the area for state and federal agencies to not apply anything. And that's kind of how we create a DIC further and create further data gaps. So being really mindful about having some type of a baseline already based on what we know. And I don't understand why that is such a point of, I guess, contention over the definition, but it's really important to make sure that that's why these narratives are already set there is we're not trying to create more of a gray area for state and federal agencies to avoid their onus and responsibility, but more of a definition to hone in where they haven't been doing that. Thank you, Renee. So I think I've now heard Renee, um, Robin, and then um, Kelly. So um, potentially by extension, Doug, kind of express an interest in, in having the baseline. Michael, Ian, Tyson, I think Uni and Ilda were on earlier, but I no longer see them, but but other task force members, do you, do you all have a preference either way on, on whether to recommend a baseline? I'm tentatively good with the first option, the one that you highlighted. Okay, so not recommending a baseline. 
Um, What's highlighted is option two, Michael. Oh, okay. Yeah, with well, the first one then. With the baseline. Sorry. Thank you. But yeah, sorry. I know it no, it's confusing. So again, option one is just just the current language with no track changes. Option two is these two sentences incorporating the track changes. Um, so so Tyson, Doug, any preferences there? And Ian, sorry, I didn't mean to leave you out. Yeah, I think option one was what uh, worked best for us. Okay. Um, I'm two. Yeah. Oh, Tyson, go, go ahead. Could, you came off mute, but I did, just heard someone else in the background. Sorry, I... Um... I am still, uh, I'm leaning towards option two, but um, again, how it works in, in the agencies and, and just the whole logistics of it, I, I just think I need to think about it a little bit more. But, you know, for, for right now, I think option two is getting, getting closer to what's needed. And I think I was misquoted. I was for option two. Yeah, I'm going to have okay. Yeah, I was going to have a baseline, but we need to work within state and federal agencies still to establish how which percentile, especially if it's higher in certain spaces for DIC. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, I did have you in the the option to baseline camp. So I, I guess I guess Joe, put me down as neutral. I, I need to look at this a little bit more. I'm not okay. I'm not prepared to give you yay or nay on, on either option. Okay, um, Doug, go ahead. Say. Yeah, I, I just think I'm a little bit confused about where we are on which is one and which is two, maybe. Um, can you kind of can you kind of restate that the the question? I, I apologize. I'm just I might be a little bit lost here. Sure. I well, so so, so option option. Two is the language that you see here. That would be saying there would be a baseline percentile in Enviro screen. Okay. Option one is the language as it was originally written. So, okay. so this sentence without the track changes, which is that okay. the task force would not be recommending a baseline, just letting agencies I, decide each time. Okay, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. So yeah, it would be option two is where we want to land. I apologize, I, I had it backwards in my head. The, the, no problem, Doug. We should have probably written this out as, as two separate options before the discussion. So um, I apologize for that. We're, <laughs> we, we were really focused on getting you the data and I didn't think through how best to facilitate the conversation. Um, so it, it sounds like for the most part, folks are leaning towards this option two of establishing a baseline, but there's still some kind of confusion or desire for further, further thought and in, in, in diving into it. So. I think what we'll do is we will go ahead and include this as kind of a decision point um, with the options more clearly spelled out for the full task force to take a straw poll on at the October meeting. Um, please, please, please take like five minutes to play around with Ronnie's data tool be before October 24th and really get your mind around what this means in practice. Um, and, you know, as the kind of task force reps on the subcommittee, you all can hopefully come into that discussion with kind of a, a clear idea in your mind of, of what you think um, based on having reviewed the data so that we're ready to kind of um, get closer to a final decision. Um, so yeah, Kelly and then Renee, and then we'll, we'll take our break that we're a little overdue for. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I just wanna understand when we talk about menus and discretion, we're talking about replacing B2 in the draft recommendations or supplementing so that the multiple factors and vulnerable populations and socioeconomic stressors is implemented through EnviroScreen scoring. And I'm asking because we've gotten comments saying that we should be considering energy burdened customers or uh, incarcerated people to be disproportionately impacted based on our the kinds of areas that we regulate. And so I, I, 
I just want to gauge maybe those are questions that we do in our equity analysis and they're not necessarily, you know, it, they're not necessarily factors to be included in the definition of DI communities, but I just want to understand if I am, in terms of moving to a standardized definition, we're losing the flexibility to say, to make those determinations and we are applying the flexibility with regard to Enviro screen score. Okay, I've got that wrong. That is good to know. Yeah, so so I, I think to, this is kind of the same point that Robin and Ian were making earlier, like your, your overall recommendations, like we, we haven't edited this paragraph, right? That how agencies apply the definition would be up to that agency on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, and you know, we still don't know exactly which of these options you're going to pick. That's our discussion in the, the second part of the meeting today of, do you want kind of like single fixed definition, like all agencies always apply this one versus like a menu of options that agencies can select from. So the, the conversation we are having now is basically like what is on that menu um, it is, and for, for the cumulative impacts menu item, do you all want to like specify a number or do you want it to like have that be an additional point of, of you know, discretion? So if the agency pulls that off the menu and says we're using cumulative impacts in this application, you know, is it saying, and we're gonna decide what percentage Enviro screen score to use? Or is it just say, we pull this off the menu, which means we are automatically using at least 80th or 90th percentile in Enviro screen? And and I'm sorry if I'm I'm being dense on this, but the we're talking about uh, B two being partially implemented through EnviroScreen, but still being a menu that a, an agency could use. Okay, great, thank you. Renee, please go ahead. Sorry to throw a monkey wrench in it, but why does it have to be either or to some degree? Wouldn't a baseline be able to establish exactly what it is, a baseline, and then it can differentiate given the, literally trying to find the source of equity and inequities, given however it is around the percentile across the state? So I guess I'm just wondering, why does it have to be either or? Why can it be more inclusive of both aspects of this? Yeah, you know, I, I, Renee, I think I may have been trying to frame it to binary. I, I think option two is a little bit of both, right? Like it has a sentence saying that individual agencies can decide whether to exceed the baseline. Um, you know, just, just to be candid, ultimately, like what, what I hope you all can achieve is like having gone through the brain damage of trying to wrap your mind around these concepts and understand the process and work through it that you all can give some guidance to agencies so that someone picking up a rulemaking that uses the term disproportionately impacted community for the first time doesn't have to go through the year of really hard work that you all have been doing, right? So, you know, your role is to help clarify so that all of the murkiness in the definition is as clear as possible in the future. So, um, so I, I, I think that you know, I, to, to your point, like, I think there is a both framework and, and maybe it is necessary for in each individual decision-making process agencies to have to go through this really challenging thought process. But, you know, what I think we're trying to sort of get you to as, as at least your staff is kind of saying, here's all the data that we, we can pull for you to figure out whether you want to get more specific guidance. And if the answer is ultimately like, you think there needs to be just kind of a pretty open-ended discussion in each case, that's totally fine. But you know, know that that means that kind of in each case where an agency applies this in the future, like we're going to have basically the same really challenging and confusing discussion, right? So so that 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 is, we, we're trying to at least get you the data so you can decide whether that process, which, you know, I, I think I framed it a little negatively, but like on a positive side, like allows individual tailoring and honing and, and focusing and considering different communities differently and individualized decision-making, like, you know, that might be valuable, right? But, um, 
but we also want to make sure you all kind of have a chance to think through like do we want to give a little more guidance um, to kind of at least give a better starting point or maybe a clearer fixed number for, for folks to use in the future. Um, okay, we are we are half an hour overdue for our break, so let's go ahead and take that break. Um, let's take five minutes and come back at, at 5.05. Welcome back. I see Lubna is on camera. Could um, task force members who are back at their computers maybe quickly raise, come on camera for a sec or, or do a thumbs up to let us know that you're here.
Um, well, it looks like we have Doug and Renee at least. Um, I realize Robin might not be able to raise her thumb or come on camera since she's on the phone. Okay, Ian's here. So I think we have critical mass. Let's go ahead and get started. So um, kind of just going back to the agenda, now it's time to kind of continue our discussion of the recommendations and in retrospect, maybe you should have reversed the order of how we had these discussions um, today, but now it's time to kind of talk about that menu question, right, of um, you know, this kind of area that we weren't able to reach consensus on at the August meeting of kind of whether there should be a single definition of disproportionately impacted community that applies to where, where all state agencies apply the same factors or whether there should be a menu of different factors, right? So um, this would be, you know, to, again, just as an example, that where, where you've all landed is that you do believe that there should kind of be one place in, in, statu in statute, so presumably the Administrative Procedure Act, where the definition of disproportionately impacted community appears rather than there being separate definitions for the Public Utilities Commission in title, D Doug or Kelly would have to pull that in for me. I don't actually don't know what title and a, a separate one for CDPHE in, in title 25, right? So the idea is there's one, one place for the definition and then you all kind of have kind of not, not yet decided on your preference between two options. Um, this was an area that didn't get um, consensus at, at, in August about whether there should be one definition for all state agencies. So that would be, you know, again, agencies would still have some discretion in the implementation, but, you know, they would just be, for example, race, income, housing cost burden, cumulative impacts, low income energy, um, custom, low income energy assistance program eligibility, um, and um, linguistic isolation, for example. So six prongs that, that all agencies have. The other option is a, a menu of different factors and agencies could sort of pull the ones that work best for them um, each time they kind of do a rulemaking process to implement the definition. So I, I hope I kind of teed up that discussion as well as I can, and maybe folks can start weighing in on whether they have preferences there and whether we can kind of get get maybe a, a preferred option or a single option on the table to kind of um, get discussion or hopefully consensus for the full task force at the um, October meeting. Go ahead, Renee. I'm still for option one. Honestly, the feedback that I've been getting from community and then even going by community comments in this space too, it's incredibly important for state and federal agencies to meet community at where it's at and where it's already been defined and already so many other previous rulemakings. Thanks, Renee. Doug? Yeah, I also uh, support option one. Uh, I, I think that would... Uh, resolve a lot of issues. And, you know, if everyone has different definitions for a DI community, I think it's going to be tough for those communities to know if they're defined as such um, going before different state agencies for different issues. So I think one uh, definition will make it a lot simpler for everyone. All right, uh, thank you both. Any other thoughts on option one or option two? Kelly, go, go ahead. Thanks, I, uh, I, I feel like sometimes I'm asking questions maybe I should already know the answer to and I apologize if that's the case, but the, you know, the language says this definition should include a range of factors. So that sentence, when you're listing that, you're talking about the definition that we just include discussed under, you know, options A and B with B including linguistic isolation. Or are you talking about further modifications to that definition based on adding linguistic isolation and things like that? So I think that would be, I just want to make sure I understand that. But then the other point to um, sort of supplement what Doug was saying is, yeah, I, I think, 
you know, if you're talking about a generating unit and you're talking about the commission looking at an electric resource plan and CDPHE looking at permitting, it makes sense to have a standardized definition. Um, but I did just want to flag one thing that means for us is we potentially have under the Senate Bill 272 definition, potentially more census blocks identified as low income based on different income thresholds. We have started the process of, of looking at that. And thank you very much to CDPHE staff who have been helping with that. Uh, at this stage, I don't think we think that it is um, a large number of different census block groups. So I, that just informs kind of some of our thinking on moving to a standard definition, but our, you know, and then to emphasize our definition is in Title 40. So I, you know, I don't, I don't know the legal aspects of that, if there can be reference, cross references, that sort of thing, how that works. Um, those were the, some of the points I wanted to kind of raise in thinking about the standardization piece. Thank, thanks, Kelly. And I, I think um, that the, to summarize that sort of maybe whether there should be a menu depends on what is on the menu. Is, is that what I'm hearing you say? And um, I, the, the, what I just listed just now when I was saying potential menu options, the, those are essentially all of the factors that currently are used by any state agency in, in the different definitions, right? So for example, the Oil and Gas Commission has linguistic isolation in its definition. The Public Utilities Commission has low income energy assistance. So I was I, I was listing every single factor. Um, I probably missed some, I was doing it off the top of my head, um, just as an example of what could be on the menu, but not trying to say that choosing the menu option versus the single definition would um, would uh, require at the same time deciding what's on the menu. So, so maybe we could keep that to a separate discussion if that's okay. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I agree with Doug in terms of option one, but thank you. Great, and I see um, Michael in chat and Ian also preferring option one. Um, and that, that is the option that had the most consensus. Um, you know, last time there was a, it wasn't a, a clear majority, but it was a eight, eight on option one, uh, five on option two. Um, so maybe we could sort of go into October having had this discussion with sort of option one as the default and try that on for size for, for the task force members. Is there anyone who wants to make like a strong push for, for option two? Maybe someone who um, voted for that at the um, August meeting, if you remember which option you voted for. I, I will admit I have not kept track of which task force member voted for what, but did want to see if anyone wanted to make a push for that before we move on. Okay, um, hearing none, let's go ahead and move on to the next topic then. Um, this is our kind of other tough question that, that we've gone over multiple times. So, um, you know, I, I think I will keep pushing as a facilitator that these are really hard questions. We have data and it can be really difficult to make decisions, but you know, as we get closer and closer to November 14th, when the task force has to complete its work, like we will have to kind of make some hard decisions, right? So, you know, this discussion is a chance to raise questions, say like, I need more information on this, or kind of just kind of, sometimes it's easier to try an idea on out loud um, and just kind of share what you're thinking in terms of the question. So this, this next question that for us to discuss is, um, housing cost burden and whether housing cost burden should remain part of a definition. So I'm just gonna share again, a link to the analysis, the mapping tool that Margaret Horden created that we discussed at the last meeting. Um, this is a, a map that essentially shows the areas that um, meet only the housing cost burning component of the date of the definition. So these are areas that would not be considered a disproportionately impacted community, but for 
the housing cost burden prong. So there are other areas that have more than 40% of their population that are housing cost burdened, but though they also have more than 40% of their population that are low income or people of color. So those census block groups are not shown. This is this is housing cost burden alone. Um, so maybe having had a little more time to look at this map or reflect on their discussion from last time, I do wanna bring us back to the question that again, we kind of didn't have a clear consensus on at the um, August meeting of whether housing cost burden should remain part of the definition. So um, like, like the earlier question, I, presenting it as a binary, perhaps it doesn't need to be that and there's some option three that is a compromise, but I, I do wanna kind of start out with that yes, no question. So Renee, go ahead. Yes, given predatory development and practices in the past that has even had redlining or targeted communities to be in certain marginalized zones around even fence line areas, I would put housing cost burden as an issue. And then of course, a number of other issues from land rights and then actual quality of the spaces, water quality, land quality, access. Thank you, Renee. Um, any uh, one else with thoughts or perhaps reactions to Renee's thoughts? Did we did we talk about differentiating housing versus energy cost, or is that all kind of encompass? So um, I think that's a that's a little bit of a different question, right? So um, sorry, I'm going to stop my screen share so I can call up a different um, visual really quick. But the the way that um, the sorry, let me get the visual up because I think it will really help to to see it. So I'm just going to share the slide that we went over um, at some of our, our earlier meetings of the subcommittee. Um, so this this slide shows the definition of disproportionately impacted community okay. that applies to different agencies. I had to, I've, I had to, it's been a while since I've seen this. Yeah, no, that okay. it's a good pressure. Yeah. Yep. So, so multiple agencies, including CDPHE, the Department of Transportation, the Public Utilities Commission, in Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So, so four out of the five agencies that currently have a definition have housing cost burden as a factor in that definition, right? So I think the question we're asking right now is whether that should remain the same. Um, one agency, the Public Utility Commission, and in all those same agencies also have low income as, as part of their definition, right? So the, the Public Utilities Commission is unique because it has three different definitions of low income, um, which are what I would call an absolute metric of income, a comparative metric of income, and then areas that are eligible for low income energy assistance. And I, I might need to phone a friend and Ronnie can remind me or, or Kelly can remind me kind of the specifics of, of each of those. So um, that, that's a long way of saying, Michael, that, that that's a relevant question. And Maybe another way to look at it is this is the menu kind of when we're talking about the menu, right? Like this this full range of ideas that the legislature has talked about. But right now, I think the specific question is just this housing cost burden problem. Okay, thank you. I want to keep the housing burden in. Yeah, I think we recognize that when people are spending their income trying to stay housed, it makes it very challenging for them to participate in other things. And so I'd like to see it stay. You can add me to that as well. Any other thoughts? And Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree. Leave it in. That's that's good agreement. That's great. Uh, anyone want to make a, a pitch for option two or other voices in favor of option one?
Okay, well, maybe then we can do the same thing that we did with, with the prior point and just sort of, you know, that option one was, um, had the most votes last time in the straw poll, though not quite enough to hit, you know, kind of a, a clear majority, but given this discussion today, we can kind of similarly present that as the default option when we, when we get to making a decision with the full task force in October, it sounds like at least the folks who are on kind of in the subcommittee and have engaged the most are all leading towards option one. I hate to ask this question, Joe, but what, I mean, August was a, was a tough month for me. Um, what was the, um, what was the issues that folks were having with, because I see eight, eight task members voted in favor and five. What, what were, what were, I'm just curious. Because yeah. to me, it, to me, it seems like a no brainer to have that in there. And it's already in the menu option that you showed earlier, but just, just out of curiosity, why? I think the arguments that I've heard before, and I would put him on the spot, but it looks like he's dropped out. Um, I think Tyson has brought this up a lot, is that um, area is that areas that only need the housing cost burden component um, include a lot of fairly affluent areas, right, that have very high housing costs. So I'm just zooming in, but you can see there's a lot of areas in the Roaring Park Valley near Aspen, um, in the Vale Valley near Vale, um, kind of in Summit County. And then if you look at the Denver metro area, a lot of areas in the kind of southern suburbs, right? So that tend to be a little more affluent, southern and western suburbs, as well as much of the sort of city of Boulder. Um, so you can kind of see the areas that fall in just under that prong tend to be a little more affluent than, um, than areas that meet other components of the definition. And the reason is that the low income component of the definition does sort of accurately capture um, sort of an absolute metric of income. So less affluent areas generally come in, in under that prong. So I think the discussion the task force had is, is often like, what does having, you know, in the past ideas that I've heard, I think mostly Tyson raised is what is having housing cost burden add? Um, and I think a counter that I've heard, I think I, Ian, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I heard you say this in a past meeting, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that, yeah, that's true, but you, even though these areas are more affluent, housing costs are really expensive there, and there are often, it's a sign that there are pockets of sort of less affluent areas, right? So if we think about our mountain communities, like, you know, this is portions of um, Pitkin and um, Garfield County and kind of the Roaring Fork Valley, but the really expensive housing costs there have kind of the greatest impacts on working families that are lower income who are really having a hard time finding housing to work in a place like a resort community. So even though it's overall more affluent, the fact that housing costs are so high means that we should still be paying attention to the kind of pockets of inequality or the really extra extra burdens that are faced by um, folks in lower income brackets there. So um, would welcome other people to weigh in, but that's kind of my recollection of kind of the pro and con points that have been raised on this topic in the past. No, very good overview. I don't, I don't want to belabor. I know we're, I think we're running behind schedule anyway. Um, I'm good. Um, and um, I think it should remain on there. So thank you. Great. Well, <laughs> thanks, Michael. And it's funny you should say that you all actually got way back on schedule um that that those two discussions i thought would take like two hours so um that that is actually the last thing we have on the agenda besides public comment um so i will maybe pause before we go to public comment and just see if there are any other topics um particularly things in the draft recommendations folks want to bring up but we, we did thanks to that being a much shorter discussion than i anticipated um with kind of consensus on option one on each of those points. Um, we have completed all the agenda items that Ian and I put together. So um, any other task force members with, with topics they'd like to raise or things that you felt rushed on earlier that you'd like to go back to? Kelly, go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if we could look at the section 4B wording changes and having had the conversation, if maybe you could kind of recap where you think the, like, like the statutory language changes might be.
Um, on, good, thanks for letting us know, Renee, and thanks for joining. Um, okay, on the fly statutory edits. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, I think um, you know, just to reiterate, it sounds like we we would not be changing the statutory language, right? Um, we would be keeping housing cost burden in. Um, that that's a point of discussion we just had. The 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 other point that we just discussed with the options about kind of the menu and how agencies apply it. That would that would be to statutory language that is not here. It would actually be to the, a change to the definition of of agency. Um, and, and Robin, please jump in if I'm getting that wrong. That appears elsewhere, but there would need to be pretty extensive changes to how that appears in, in, in Title 24 right now to kind of reflect both how the definition and then the application of the definition plays out for different state agencies. Um, and then the, the other thing that we've been talking about in terms of the statutory language is um, this, this component here, which is what we would call the cumulative impacts prong. Um, and that would be, potentially it sounds like if, if folks go this way, adding sort of something, I'm, I'm just going to make this up, um, but to identify um, areas that meet this component of the definition, agencies may use Colorado Enviro screen with a recommended baseline per percentile score for areas that meet the definition of X. Obviously, that would need to be refined extensively by you all and by the legislature um, to, to make it make sense. But that that's sort of where I think to Robin's initial question, that language could be either added or alternatively, this whole section could be replaced with just, you know, Enviro screen. Does that answer your question, Kelly? Uh, yeah, it does. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, it's again, back to what I'm trying to grapple with where we have gotten comments about specific aspects. And I think some folks have raised energy burden other than me on this. And I think my question has been is in order to add a community that is energy burdened, a census block that is energy burdened, it would have to kind of have to fall under that prong of B2 and the other factors under, if we otherwise retain what the, what the language is on the table. And so there may be some flexibility agencies have that is kind of reduced to that point. Kelly, I think that's a great question because it, it could go there or it could be just sort of adding the criteria that, that the public utility commission already has here in the demographic section, right? So sort of adding, um, you know, I'm just going to make this up, but the proportion of the popu population that is energy for cost burdens is greater than 40%, right? And I'm just totally making it up, but it could go there. And I think that's a good question for, for you and Doug and Michael and other task force members is if you see that fitting better as kind of a a fixed demographic prong versus one of the many factors that could contribute to kind of the cumulative impacts prong. Well, and I, I'm not sure I'm quite in a place of recommending that, I, but I, it's helpful to sort of talk about the options here because in, so that we can, we can react and other people can react just in hearing what I'm hearing in other, um, in our pre rule making context. Thanks, Kelly, and I'll, I'll just kind of put, we, th this, will, this will not be what you all see at the October meeting, but just to put it on the page so people can see both options. So one is this demographic prong, and then the other would be adding energy costs in this list of kind of stressors that contribute to cumulative impacts. Um, other folks with comments or thoughts on kind of those options for where energy costs could or should fit into the definition? I guess I would just add, a, if, if others aren't chipping in, it might be adding something that doesn't need to be added here. And I'm, I'm not necessarily in a place to suggest that it should be. I just kind of wanted to understand what we're, what we're gaining and what we're losing and as we talk about the language here. So thank you.
Thanks, Kelly. Ho hopefully visualizing that was helpful. I'm not a very visual person, as you all have probably guessed, so I want to make sure we kind of come up with visual aids um, where possible to kind of help make some of these conversations more concrete. Um, any other task force members or with kind of thoughts or ideas about topics that we didn't cover today that you wanted to discuss further? Not seeing any. Um, Ian, are, are you good as kind of the, the chair with opening it up for public comment a little bit early? Not hearing Ian, let, let's go ahead and do that and, and just open it up for public comment then. Um, so we have several members of the public here. And um, since we're ahead of schedule, I don't think we need to set a time limit. We can be pretty formal like we usually are. And yeah, I'd love to hear from folks. Katie, please go ahead. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so one, this, is, this has been great to listen to as always. Um, I just have two kind of, one quick thing. Um, uh, my student Carla suggested uh, energy, or sorry, uh, environmental justice priority communities in a in a conversation that we have. Um, so I will pass along to her that that language. I think actually equity prior priority communities um, resonates um, with us as well. I think that that's um, I, I like. I think the intention being that um, uh, as folks here have noted, like the 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 whole reason that we're developing these definitions is to prioritize action, um, which could be investment, could be enforcement, um, you know, could be a, a number of different things. So, so I think priority um, makes a lot of sense as, as something to put in. And, and um, I thought the insight of, you know, how does this translate? Can we make it shorter than environmental justice, um, particularly translated into different languages? Um, is something important to consider. So um, I really like um, equity priority communities. Um, and I, I thought that's interesting that that's actually being used in other in other contexts already. Um, so so really um, interested to, to see where that goes and if that, um, you know, how that lands with community members and, and other folks, but, but I think that's a, a good direction. Um, the other thing that came up in a um, co coalition meeting um, that, that we were having the other day is an idea that actually was kind of percolating during the, the 1266 development process, um, which was, you know, could we, so, so we know that all of these different data sources that we're using to identify which communities are, you know, worthy of prioritization, let's say, um, are incomplete, that the census uh, has its flaws, that other data sources, um, you know, the, the rich data sources that EnviroScreen is incorporating, um, none of them are perfect. And a lot of them require, um, uh, you know, rely on sort of data aggregation, right? So we're sort of saying this entire area is or is not a priority area. Um, one thing that that we had found that other um, other states, other jurisdictions have done, is to allow communities to self-identify as disproportionately impacted and to have a process built in that allows for that. So it's sort of this opt-in um, process. And I have, a, um, I have a slide deck that some of you may have seen before, um, but again, this was sort of something that was discussed in the process of developing 1266. We sort of decided to, to take that out of, of, the, um, of, of the definition in, um, in the context of the legislation, but I think it's worth revisiting um, as a potential option. And, the the um, the slide deck that I can share uh, has some language that that could be part of the task force uh, recommendations, as well as some examples of the way that other folks, other um, uh, other states um, have done this. So, for example, it might be a form that's on the website that you know asks a community to define. Okay, so what's the you know what are the geographic boundaries of you know the 
the area that you're proposing to, to fall under this definition, uh, provide a you know, quantitative and or qualitative description of why. And then there obviously would need to be some sort of scoring or, or decision-making body. So maybe that's the EJ advisory board has to um, review these periodically and determine if they, um, if they meet some threshold. So I'm um, just gonna put that out as a, um, a potential additional um, arm to this definition. And like I said, I can provide those resources um, if the task force wants to look at those more closely. Thank you so much, Katie. It's really helpful to hear from you on both points. I, I should say, Dr. Dickinson, um, are there task, would task force members be interested in seeing that? And if so, I, I would really um, encourage you to submit it as a written public comment to us, um, cdphu underscore ej at state.co.us. I'll put that in the chat. Apologize to our interpreters for racing through that. Um, we can definitely make sure that gets in front of other task force members um, if it's submitted as a public comment prior to the October meeting. Any task force members or, C or um, environmental justice program staff have kind of questions, reactions, thoughts for Dr. Dickinson? Um, I just wanted to say that that's a uh... I hadn't heard um, for it was a discussion that's came up, but I haven't seen a methodology for um, communities to do that. So thank you for sharing, Dr. Dickinson. And um, definitely as sort of like a data end user, would be curious to think about how we um, how we quantify our geographic boundaries. You know, since sometimes we are li limited to the census, so that's just sort of the, the application piece. So or the implementation piece that I think through that, but obviously really important, especially given how um, if we're you know, using labels to talk about community, that ab ability for communities to define themselves is huge. Um, so I'd be really curious. And also uh, that's, yeah, that definitely really interesting and important. Thanks, Rani. Any other thoughts or questions for Dr. Dickinson? All right, any other members of the public who'd like to provide comments? So I see a couple of their folks on here with us. Not seeing anyone come off mute or raise their hand. So I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, and I think we can go ahead and wrap up a few minutes early. So thank you task force members. These are really challenging conversations about statistics and maps and laws all coming together in the most confusing possible way. So thank you for your patience with us. Um, I think I probably could have thought through how to facilitate that conversation to be a little less confusing than it was. So please accept my apologies. and. I think you've given us some clear um, direction on where we can go for the next task force meeting um, in October to kind of simplify some of these discussions a little bit and get closer to getting to final consensus on a lot of these really important concepts. So thank you all so much for your time.